Let me uh, ask um, a question because this, right, the, the way you're, you're talking about memory is very different than the way that you, you would ever learn it in medical school. Yeah. Right, I don't, I don't think this is the kind of language that, that, you know, the folks that teach us would readily use. Yeah. Um, so let me, let me kind of ask a very high level question here, um, which is, you know, there's, there's been a, a very big push in medicine in trying to enrich the intellectual breadth of the trainees. Yeah. Right. And I think, you know, for many years it had been, it, it would, in order to get into medicine, you had to do biology or biochemistry or any of a number of related fields um, in order to get in. And, you know, in the last decade, maybe the last two decades or so, um, the push has been very much to try to expand that breadth. But from my perspective, and let me know if, if I'm wrong, that, that push has been largely in the realm of the humanities. Right, and, and I wonder, right, if there would be something to gain if in addition to that, we made an equally hard push to get people from mathematics, from physics, from engineering, um, you know, largely because it, it allows, it allows the ability to, 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 to think about the same problem from a very, very different way. Yeah. Um, or I'm reminded of this, this uh, I just watched a video from Richard Feynman. He did these, these you know, series yeah. of inter famous interviews on YouTube. Yeah. Um, right, I'm reminded of this example where he's describing seeing a flower. Um, and he, he's essentially describing some, some artist or somebody from the humanities that says, Oh, you know, you scientists, you know, you can't really appreciate the beauty of a flower. You try to deconstruct it. Um, and then he retorts, he's like, no, if I could, he's like, I can see exactly what you see. And in addition, right, I can think about the fine scale molecular composition. He's like, I can think about the fact that the colors in this flower, essentially they evolved in concert with insects, right? They evolved to be attractive for insects. And so now this begs another question, which is, is there an, is there a, a form of aesthetics that exists in lower order animals that doesn't exist to us because this this thing evolved for for other beings not for us and and you know all these questions come about because you've enriched uh, you have an enriched understanding of the world yeah. um, and so you know it makes it's it's just something that makes me wonder if there's there's maybe some enrichment that we're missing um, you know partly I wonder if if you know, at least in, in popular culture, folks that are in, in mathematics, science, engineering, you know, they're a little bit kind of on the, 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 the edges of what's normal. Yeah. Um, right. Slightly ostracized. And, <laughs> I, uh, I, I think, so I, I think what you're saying is heavily institution dependent. It really depends on what the strengths of the institution are. Um, if the institution uh -huh. has a pretty strong humanities, then they have a few more seats at the committee table. So they might advocate a little bit more for their students. Mm -hmm. the Emory and Georgia Tech is a very unique situation because the, you know, Georgia Tech is there and Emory's there. They're private public. So there's this, there's this inter interesting interaction. We prioritize, I think, much to the chagrin of some in the MD-PhD program, mm -hmm. engineers. Uh, mm -hmm. of, of about my class, about half were engineers. I think since then, it's about three or four every, every cycle, but it's pretty loose. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I agree there's a push to expand the perspectives that come into med school. And I think that can only help. I think it's important to have humanities folks, to have public health folks, to have uh, it, like music folks. Everyone needs to come in and be given a chance to reframe medicine in their perspective because we need as many agents exploring the space of solutions as possible. I'm convinced it's all a Monte Carlo, right? Like we're all, we're all trying to find that sweet spot. And you need a lot of people, you need to support exploratory minds to go try to find their, find their local minima and then have them talk to each other to figure out if it's a global minima. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's heavily institution dependent where the priorities are. I think it's good. I think we don't do as much humanities recruiting as we should. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the medical schools as a whole, it, it, might be a lot more, it might be a lot more consistent since it's a lot more top down. Mm -hmm. but there is... I think, I think there is a, there is especially recently a bigger push for machine learning style folks, math style folks, 
engineering style folks, that has been drastically different just from my perspective than what I experienced in 2011 when I was interviewing. Uh -huh. 2011, I was interviewing, I said, I want to do signal, statistical signal processing, right? Like uh -huh. I wanted to be a math, I didn't say math, but I said brain signals. I want to do brain signal stuff. And I, uh -huh. I got a lot of pushback from folks. Like you need to have solid biochemistry genetics. And I, I, uh -huh. I said, I'll do my best with that, but, but it's this math part that's important. Um, I, I don't see that same level of pushback anymore. Something you said got me thinking, what was it? Oh no. It's funny what getting up and walking around does to your brain state. <laughs> maybe I think, the hippocampus I think, do funny things. <laughs> well, I th well, maybe maybe that was it. It was it was this kind of memory. So, so I naturally a hammer sees everything as a nail, and at this point, um, at this point, I took uh, like in my undergrad, I was more of a statistical a statistical thermodynamics style person, protein folding, conformational energies, that kind of stuff. Uh, then I switched gears in my kind of post grad, post undergrad into more statistical signal processing and that kind of stuff. What and dynamics? I took a dynamics uh -huh. course, and that I didn't really appreciate. I loved it. I didn't appreciate how it would come in and help. I just uh -huh. knew it was beautiful. I just knew that these curves were beautiful. That that yeah. the simple static rules of how flows go could give rise to such rich dynamics on an instance by instance basis. That was just uh -huh. that was fascinating. And then on top of that, if those rules change over time, you've got a whole other thing that becomes yeah. the brain. So actually, if I could, if I could interrupt real quick, because yeah. you, you speak very passionately about dynamics. Yes. I think, you know, more than, more than most people. Can you, you think you can summarize or try to explain like, where does, where does this kind of deep seated, love this 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 you know this uh this feeling that it's you know that there, it harbors some underlying truth what you know where does that feeling come from yeah um I, I think that's a really great point i think there's two things that give me that passion slash confidence um the confidence that that drove me in my phd decision making and in my projects was very much all the things that we were doing in science regardless Mm -hmm. are a special instance of a dynamical system. You, mm -hmm. Any system can be framed in the context of a dynamic system. Just make it static. Okay, it's a mm -hmm. static system. Make it linear. Okay, it's a linear dynamic system. If it's a linear mm -hmm. dynamic and static system, that's the entirety of systems and signals learned in undergrad, right? Mm -hmm. Input, output, no, no, no settling time, all that kind of stuff. So I think one confidence is that I just haven't found something that can't be depicted as a dynamical system. In the beginning of my PhD, I said to myself, accept emotion. Mm -hmm. Today, I'm convinced emotion, just like everything else, can be depicted in the language of dynamics. So that's one. And the other thing is very much, it's, um, it's the study of change. And that's the one constant across the board. Uh, mm -hmm. And I say change, not time change, for, for a very specific reason. Dynamics, by definition, talks about time. How do, how, do, how do variables change over time? But a lot of the interest that control theory has is how do your variables change with respect to other variables? Uh -huh. so how does the change in your, your physical state, where you are in the US, change as a function of whether you're in a car? Uh -huh. Right. So x of t, the, the, the trajectory you trace out through life, is a function of all these other variables, which sounds like science. Um, so we can, we can reframe science in that context by saying, well, we keep everything constant. So dx by du1, we want to be zero. Uh -huh. dx by du2, we want to be zero. dx by du3, we want to be the thing we're studying. How does our, our dependent variable x change with respect to our independent variable u3? Uh -huh. And the time part of it becomes the piece that I think was missing in the elegance of answers that um and the best way to convey that is taking a physics without calculus class and learning the kinematics equations just learning all the all, how how it was structured there's four of them i believe uh -huh. just learning them it just left me with a funny weird feeling of like why why these four why these uh -huh. four why not five why not three why are they structured the way they're structured and then taking a physics with calculus 
uh -huh. uh, course and changed the entire, each of these equations was just a special case of a single equation, depending on what you cared about looking at. Uh -huh. So dynamics really seems like the thing that ties things together. It's, it's that unifying principle. It's that drive that I think we all have towards a grand unified theory. We all look to uh -huh. different things to find grand unified theories. We look to physics, we look to faith, we look to purpose, we look to jobs. But I think the shortest way to say all that second point is, is dynamics is, is the study of change and change is unavoidable, but change is also beautiful. Uh, uh -huh. we, we will all change and trying to resist change just means we're gonna change in ways that we're unclear on. Yeah. Embracing it, going with the flow, I think is, this starts getting way too out there, but it's, it's, it's happiness. It's, it's, it's understanding the environment you're in, understanding the limitations of how you can control yourself in those environments, in those dynamics, mm -hmm. and then being deliberate in your decision-making when it's necessary. And sometimes just going with the flow when it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it, it really tied together all of my interests, which include neuroscience, but also include non-neuroscience. It includes philosophy, it includes these other things that start getting at the idea of how can you know, and how can you know how things behave when you ignore the fact that they change in time? Mm -hmm. That's the part that I just can't ever get over. Any, any model that ignores time has major, major, major limitations. So I've, mm -hmm. I'm naturally then, all, everything I do starts with dynamics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think what's nice, there's kind of a deep theme here that I've been thinking about for a while, which is the power of, it's really the power of mathematics to kind of reveal the, the beauty that exists out there. Yeah. Right, and it's, it's one of the harder things for me to convey in day-to-day -day life, is that feeling that, that it gives you. Like to me, it gives, it gives the kind of, the, the, you know, it, I get the same kind of chills. Yes. You know, I might get seeing a beautiful sunrise. Like you, you, you feel like there's something about the world that's just crystallized. Like I just put something on um, Twitter today. I, I think I saw that you, you um, liked it or, uh, or something like that. Yeah. Which was, I'm reading a piece right now on information theory, yeah. <laughs> which, you know, it, 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 to most people probably sounds like one of the driest things you could possibly read, right? Information theory, yes, no question, bits. Yeah. Um, but what's beautiful about this is that there is, there is, it exists in a very real sense. And so I'll just, I'll just summarize the, the, the passage that I, I tweeted, um, which is right, an information theory, a bit, right? If I, if I need another bit of information, it is equivalent to saying I need to, I need to answer another yes, no question. Right? It's a bit binary. Um, and so, okay, how can we relate this to something in reality? Right? And so it turns out, um, if, you need to, if, you, if you ask the question of where is a particular molecule of water when it's sitting in ice, you have to ask so many questions. I, I don't know however many it is, let's say 10 questions. When that ice melts into water, right, the nature of the change physically is such that I need to ask one more yes or no question. Right? It's n plus one question, one more bit. Yes. Right? And so the chemists, unbeknownst to this line of reasoning, Right, have for years been measuring the entropy changes associated with water melting into ice. And it turns out that if you change the units from what the chemists have been using into bits, you get almost exactly an increase in one bit per molecule. Beautiful. And like that, that, that cannot exist as a coincidence, yeah. right? That, this, that reality in some way is, is you know, it, it's hard to look at a result like that and not question whether reality in some way is built in these, these sort of like knowable units. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And that, that to me is just one example, but there's, you know, examples abound in, you know, I think physics is the most famous field for this. Um, I think one of the, one of the chills, one of the earliest chills I got was pendulum versus planetary motion. I, I was obsessed with astronomy. Oh, yeah. I was obsessed um, with astronomy growing up, uh, obsessed with Star Wars as well. Um, but Astro like I was, I was so into planets. And so it was just, it was just this big thing. How could we possibly understand it? And then learning that a pendulum and, and celestial motion are both this uh -huh. kind of quadratic potential was uh -huh. just like, whoa, whoa. Uh, this is, you know, 
this is weird. I didn't at the time know, is this just a coincidence? Is this just the language is able to explain two very distinct things or there's an underlying symmetry uh -huh. that is manifest in two different ways uh -huh. uh, through, ver through slight iterations, through slight perturbations, the same like um, law, the same rule set, the same dynamic set just exhibits itself in different ways because you're projecting it in a different light, mm -hmm. which, which does start, we, we will, we'll spare the uh, really crappy philosophy that I don't have background wise, but this notion of, of a, a fundamental truth that is seen in multiple ways or, mm -hmm. or, you know, we are all searching for that truth and everyone's experiences are different. So it, it, it got me thinking about the connections between things a lot more. And I think math does this. Math says, what do I need to do to Y to make it look like X? Uh -huh. And everything I need to do to Y to make it look like X is information about the structure. How do I make this thing that doesn't look like A, I should not do mixed metaphors or mixed variables. How do I make this Y that does not look like X look like X tells me so much about both Y and X. Uh -huh. it's, it's, that, it's that mapping, that morphism from Y to X that contains so much information with respect to certain properties. Am I just looking visually? Well, then I just learned a little something about vision in uh -huh. transforming Y into X. It's, uh -huh. it's this ability to find the connection between s disparate things. Um, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G are all different letters. What do they all share in common? They're letters, uh -huh. right? Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, those are very different symbols, very different letters, but what do they share in common? Well, they're kind of have temporal relationship with A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, so, so, so I'll, I'll stop there. I think, I think there are these cases of shared dynamics, shared laws, shared principles, information theory being a perfect language for that. And then mm -hmm. the information theory being one, but one central window into the, commonalities of seemingly dis disparate things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well let me let me lead that into the uh kind of the big question here which yeah. is how how do you take how do you take these kind of these big ideas right that they're kind of they're they're abstract um but clearly things you've been working on for a while and how if at all do you try to relate it to the career you have envisioned in medicine I mean, for you neurosurgery? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good question for, for, um, I've been thinking about this a lot recently. I've been thinking about it a lot, but, but without having a clear idea of what clinic the clinic looked like and what healthcare looked like, I, I felt a little strange making decisions, but it was a fun exercise. Ultimately, a lot of these, so my PhD background was in deep brain stimulation for depression. This is a classic case of severely ill patients have tried everything else, but really their lives are at risk. Trying an experimental uh, therapy called deep brain stimulation started in the 70s, 80s, and they get better. They just get better. I, I know their starting points. Each patient is slightly different. I know their ending point. Each point is different, but with respect to whether they're healthy, healthy or not, they're all the same, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we trace their trajectories through that space from not well to well? Because those trajectories tell you what DBS does into that state space and the emotion state space as well as the neural state space, which should have a mapping between the two. So it becomes the language of math, the language of mappings, the, ma the language of functions. How do I transform X to look like Y? Well, that's called Y equals F of X. F is what you have to do to X to make it look like Y. What do I need to do in this disease, schizophrenia, to transform it to look like healthy, given the knowledge I just gained from doing that with depression? Finding these unifying principles of DBS, finding out how neuromodulation comes in, affects the neural dynamics, and then how those neural dynamics then get reflected in a change in clinical, emotional, cognitive dynamics. How that fits into neurosurgery is more, um, I think the neurosurgeons are the engineers of, 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 um, of most of these neurotherapies. They're the ones that are on the ground, kind of implanting things. They have the tools, they have a garage, they, they, they have to, they have to toe the line between 
knowing things in and out and also adapting to the uncertainties that are always going to be present in the OR. Uh -huh. So the way you do that is by having really solid guiding principles, really solid underlying principles. Uh, I can't think of a better word. Uh, principles like, you know, diminished returns. How, how close do I want to get to this target? Knowing that it takes double the effort to just go slight, slight improvements in that. You uh -huh. need to know when to stop. You need to know when, you need to know when close enough in the brain is close enough without uh -huh. being, you know, irresponsible to the patient. So uh -huh. you, you're, you're forced to integrate all this information in a way that constantly tests these basic principles that you've developed. And uh -huh. dynamics gives you those basic principles. Um, when I stimulate, I silence two regions. Well, I can translate that into this other circuit. I need to figure out which, which regions then need to be silenced. Well, then let's go do it. Let's go stimulate there in an OR, do it in a way where you don't have to permanently implant something. You can test it in short term where you won't get long-term dynamic changes, but with a short-term change of this amount, you can predict hopefully good one day, whether they'll get better seven months from now. Mm -hmm. So it, it's still hazy. I'm still, I'm still trying to really pack it together in a way that um, that's not DBS centric. I, I do want to expand beyond DBS. I think what interests me the most is what neural circuits, what neural dynamics underlie emotion, what neural circuits and, and uh, dynamics underlie mood. Just to start asking those deep questions about what, you know, all this richness that we see in human interactions, where does it come from? Uh -huh. And the neurosurgery part of it is very much just being at that interface of patient care, being that engineer that's working with his hands and being the scientist slash uh, reverse engineer. I think I'm more of a reverse engineer than I am a scientist. Um, really figuring out why the thing that just worked, why did it work? Uh -huh. Backtrack it, figure out what the black box looks like, and then iteratively improve. Uh -huh. So it's all about iteration there. It's not about getting everything in a nice, clean study and really, really, really hammering it through. It's more about that adaptive Bayesian style. I'm coming into this case with this understanding. This last patient changed my understanding this little bit, but I should be careful not to overfit to that one patient, uh -huh. but I can see trends in the last two patients. I threw, a, uh, none of that I think was coherent, but, but those, those, those are kind of the, the pieces I'm playing with as I'm leading up to making a final decision on residency. I'll, I'll, uh -huh. I'll turn the question right back at you. What, um, you know, how, how did these pieces come together? We, we didn't quite get to talk about third year, fourth year as much, there, that's a whole separate thing. I think you and I both had great experiences in uh -huh. here where oh, our absolutely. engineering background maybe set us apart in ways that are hard to even convey um, that uh -huh. problem solving part of it. But what, how, how do these pieces come together? The medical piece, the engineering piece come together in a decision to pursue psychiatry, I believe. 